Thank you. When my two sons were toddlers, I read them stories or told them stories pretty much every evening. And I remember the sparkle in their eyes, their passion and curiosity, their hunger to learn. Now, what I've experienced over the past 20 years teaching at various business schools is that by the time our children get to college, all this curiosity and passion seems to have been reduced to one question. Do you grade on a curve? <laughs> this is by far the most common question I get at the beginning of a new class, and it makes me incredibly frustrated and sad. I dream of a day when instead I walk into a class and students shout, what are we going to learn in this class? Now, of course, there are wonderful exceptions to my observations. And without these exceptional students, this inaugural TEDx UC Irvine event would not have come about. Well, how about all the passion and energy that students shared on this stage today with us? Amazing. But they are the exceptions. And even Einstein already noticed, it is a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. So I'm going to share some of my thoughts about what, how, and most importantly, why we teach today. To teach, what does it mean? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it says, to impart knowledge, to give instruction. If this is true, then my job as a teacher is to transfer what is in my head into the heads of my students and then check in exams whether the content has arrived safely and completely. Now, this may work in a world where what is in my head is and will remain relevant in the future. But this is not the world, world we live in. Instead, we live in a world where everything around us is changing at a mind-boggling pace, yet what we teach has changed only a little. I have the feeling that by the time our children get to college, their passion has been crushed by a mountain of largely irrelevant material, and their curiosity has been replaced by the fear of failing an exam. We must change that. But we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I recently watched a video where high school students were asked some fairly straightforward questions like, can you name a country that starts with the letter U? And I was floored when I heard a student answer, Europe. <laughs> we must change that too. There is a body of fundamental knowledge that our students do need to master. But do we really need to teach the details of calculus to every student? Seriously? All right. Wouldn't it be much better if we taught them how to think critically, or how to engage in open yet respectful discussions with each other, or how to make better decisions? So we need to make what we teach much more relevant. But we also need to look at how we teach. Let me share another story with you. When I was a professor at Purdue, I was uh, part of a group of families that got together and started a new school. We called it the New Community School. And we had children ranging from kindergarten through grade eight, yet we divided them into three groups, which we lovingly called the littles, the middles, and the bigs, hoping that they would learn as much from each other as they would learn from us and their teachers. One day, I was asked to give a lesson on probability and statistics. So I decided to demonstrate some fundamental principles of sampling and sampling distributions, especially the impact of different sampling si sample sizes, without ever using these words. I walked in with three brown bags that I had filled with 50 yogurt-covered and 50, uh, 50 uh, chocolate-covered raisins the night before. I handed a bag to each of uh, three groups of students and gave them the following uh, task. They were to find out 
the percentage of brown raisins in their bag. By taking out a few raisins at a time, count and record how many brown ones they found, throw them back in, do this over and over again until I say stop. Now, the first group took out four raisins at a time, the next group took out eight raisins at a time, and the last group took out 16 raisins at a time. It was so much fun watching these kids. They looked like detectives. And they probably wondered whether they could eat the raisin, uh, raisins at the end, <laughs> which, by the way, we did. So after they were done, I asked them to share what they had found. And without my input, they walked up to the blackboard and drew pictures that looked something like this. So I asked them, what does this all mean? And they said, you probably put an equal amount of white and brown raisins in each bag, didn't you? I said, yes. Do you know for sure? Well, no, we don't know for sure, but most of the time it's around 50%. Great. But when I then asked them, why is it that for the group who took out 16 raisins at a time, the percentages are so much closer to 50% than for the other groups, this nine-year-old girl said, well, Thomas, if you take out four at a time, chances are that every now and then you get only brown or only white ones. But if you take out 16 at a time, this can never happen. Listening to Annie's insight and explanation was one of the highlights of my teaching career because she taught me a lesson that day. Namely, that even children have an intuition for highly abstract principles and that how we teach can be tailored to the individual characteristics of our students. How I teach these days looks more like this. <laughs> this is a photo of my students that I took uh, just uh, a few months ago. <clears throat> Not a lot of opportunity for me to interact and connect with them on an individual level, is there? And it's no wonder that so many students earlier said, let me get out of this room. This photo reminds me of an assembly line approach that presumes a one-size-fits-all mentality can make education more efficient, just like the manufacturing of only black Model Ts made the production of cars more efficient. Our children are not cars. And by the way, we don't have to buy only black cars anymore, do we? Mass production has changed to mass customization, and I believe the same can happen in education. And just like it did in the business sector, the creative use of technology can enable this transformation, can change our students from being passive consumers and bored students of a mountain of information and make them active participants in interactive and immersive learning environments. But we need to remind ourselves that, as important as it is, technology is merely a tool. A tool that can alleviate some of the symptoms, but does very little to cure the underlying disease. To get to the underlying disease, we need to dig deeper, much deeper. We need new mindsets, a free marketplace of competing ideas and alternative approaches that weed out what is not working in education and foster innovative curricula and methods of delivery that do. Most importantly, however, most importantly, we need to remind ourselves why we teach. We need to develop a culture that reminds us every day of the awesome responsibility to cultivate our most precious gift, our children and our students. We need rock stars of education, but we also need an army of unsung heroes who never receive the recognition they so deserve. We need a culture that celebrates teaching as the noble profession that it is, and that makes delivering the best possible education to all an absolute priority. So I believe that we must and that we can do better for our children. <clears throat> I also believe that behind all these difficulties lurks opportunity. The opportunity to dream about a better world, 
A world where our students feel excited, confident, and prepared to take the future of this world into their own hands. A world created through the collaborative effort of all involved in education. And do you know how I will recognize that my dream has come true? When one day I walk into class and excited and hungry students shout, what are we going to learn? Thank you.